chose a predominantly male profession like commercial real estate and went on to become the first woman fighter pilot of a Navy F-14 Tomcat. How do you achieve that kind of success when nobody who looks like you has modeled the way forward? So obviously it's a bit of a challenge, but in my mind, I had also known about the wasps who flew in the 40s. So explain who the wasps are real quick. Oh, so the wasps were the, the women uh, Air Force service pilots. So they flew almost 2 million hours during World War II. So they did everything but deploy overseas. So they were a critical component of, of our success there. But then they were told, hey, once once that was done, go home, have kids, do not speak of this experience again. And so for the next 40, 50 years for some of them, they never spoke about it. So it was interesting being a pioneer and being one of very few mm -hmm. because there is no map, there is no set of footprints to follow or people you can model yourself after necessarily. Mm -hmm. So the best that you can do in that in that day or in that environment is relentlessly prepare mm -hmm. and just say I'm going to show up and do the best job that I can mm -hmm. so that if an opportunity presents itself you've performed at a high enough level that in you know in my mind I was like I want to perform well enough they won't even recognize that I'm a girl yeah right which right. of course is a little naive were you inspired by the wasps or what was the inspiration was it something else that made you go I want to fly this kind of plane so I was inspired by them but also I come from a service uh, based background with my family. I've got lots of family members across the board in all services. So I knew that I wanted to serve in some capacity. My dad was actually an aviator for the Marine Corps. He was a, a Marine pilot. And of course, when your you know parent tells you this could be a good idea for you, that is naturally the last thing you're ever going to want to do. Yeah. So it took a little bit to get to that path. In your book, you share this quote from your father. The people who tell you you can't and the people who tell you you won't are usually the ones who are most afraid that you will. Can you talk a little bit about that motivation, that fearless and relentless drive that you had to get to where you actually got? Yeah, so I think it's I think it is really powerful and and it can it can help you or hurt you in different situations as well. And what do I mean by that? I think especially for women, when we are endeavoring to do something different, we're trying to go into a male-dominated environment or uh, an environment that is going to require a lot of us, a lot of stamina or a lot of showing up, um, and probably a lot of failures and setbacks, that the people closest to us oftentimes can be the ones who are like, are you sure you wanna do that? And that might be a little hard. And I think most often that comes from a good place that they want sure. to protect you but then you have this whole other segment that is telling you you can't do that and it's actually because they're threatened by it because if you can do that then what does that do to my status instead of flipping that and going hey if you're qualified if you're good let's go yeah. go for it so it ties into all of the the limiting beliefs mm -hmm. that we all have mm -hmm. about what we believe is possible for us as well as what we see in other people and whether we are going to help elevate them on their journey or if we are going to keep them playing small because we can't see what's possible. I remember you saying to me at one point that you always wanted to be um, known as a pilot, not as a woman. How has that played out for you? It's kind of this back and forth, right? It's the struggle. And I think as I've, I've gained a little more age and yeah, wisdom, yeah. What, I've, what I've realized is that from an organizational performance perspective, there you will always be a woman in commercial real estate. You will always be a female engineer. You will always be a female pilot until we've reached a critical mass number. So whether that's 21 or 23%, until we start seeing more people that look like us, you'll always be a woman in that or a female X. So there is, there's an element of frustration in that, but there's also a groundedness in knowing, hey, you know what, as long as that's the case, that means we still have work to do. So what I'm also keenly aware of as well, if we don't identify like that, what we're not doing when we're not getting out there, when we're not sharing our story, is that the, the young women, the girls who may think about for a second, I could build that building, I could develop that, and they don't see you or they don't see your story, then they don't even see it as being a possibility for them. So it's kind of this delicate balance between owning that piece of your story mm -hmm. and not wanting to be 
something different. Tell us about your experience with successful and not so successful teams and what you learned from leading them. So one of the things that I found to be really, really powerful is what I call fearless leadership by walking around. And that when you're working in that C-suite or that upper director level is that you can't think of yourself as being too busy to get to know your teammates. Because the people who I have worked with and have worked for and who I've led, the more they know their teammates, the more they know what drives them, what motivates them. You don't need to know every detail about their family, but the more you can know about each other, you build a baseline level of trust. So that when you're rolling out a new strategic plan or you're rolling out a new direction and, and you're having conversations, you're getting input, you're getting feedback, you have a really trusted team that even if you don't act on one of their suggestions, they feel heard, they feel valued and listened to, which means they'll go to the mat for you. It's the people who try to lead by edict or lead because I have a title or because I said so. I mean, as a parent, we know that on occasion, you're gonna roll out the because I said so. But if you do that for everything, it tends to be extraordinarily ineffective. And it does come down to the trust factor in teams that they trust their leader. Absolutely. To make the good decision. What would you say is the most important life lesson that you carry with you today? Oh gosh. So obviously I'm a very strong believer in the idea of fearless leadership. For some people that is a challenge because what they hear when they what they internalize when they hear that is that they shouldn't feel afraid. Mm -hmm. And yeah, actually it's the antithesis of that, right? It is having that ability to go forward when you're uncomfortable, when you have that pit in your stomach or the lump in your throat, or you feel that verp kind of coming up the back of your throat and you're like, ah, oh, this is too hard. So one of the things that has been a very steadying force for me throughout time mm -hmm. has been this idea of span of control and it's actually what my next book is going to be about. But it's this idea of how do you conquer chaos? How do you focus on the things that matter most and let everything else that you can't control go by the wayside? Because I think even now, in, in the times that we're living in now with just 24 hour plus news cycle, social media, all of these things that are pulling out all of our attention, for those of us who are, are thinking that we want to dream big, we want to make a big impact, to do something really meaningful or leave a, a meaningful lasting legacy, if we allow ourselves to get pulled in all these different directions or focusing on things we can't control, we'll never make the impact that we were destined to make. So for me, it's this idea of span of control.